Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with reference recording. Yes, one of you pointed out yesterday in the comments uh, that I really like doing these videos because I've been doing so many. Well, there are a few reasons for that. One is, yeah, I want to like pile a lot of them in because, you know, I want to cover the basic repertoire. So there's a lot of basic repertoire. So I am going to be doing a lot of these and I hope you're enjoying them too. I really do. I mean, I wouldn't do it unless I got a good response. You know, if nobody cared, then, you know, I would, I would do less. But it seems like you're enjoying the conversations as well. So I'm going to keep doing them until we don't enjoy them anymore. Anyway, that was one reason. The other reason is this. I, one of the great beauties, I think, of this series is that we talk not just about the works themselves, but also their discographic histories. And one of the reasons I have this this channel at all, and we chat back and forth, and I like to talk about it, is because I really would like to share, you know, the knowledge that I've gleaned over the past, you know, 50 years or so doing this um, about about recordings. I love recordings. I love the art of recording <laughs> and and the history of recordings. It's very, very interesting, often is not, and how things get to become popular and why we treasure some over others for reasons both musical and not necessarily musical. Uh, and this is one of those cases as well. A very, very interesting topic. Even, even the recordings of mundane works that we don't even give two thoughts to can be fascinating from a historical point of view as regards their recordings, as regards the history of the recordings and uh, how they came to be what they are. So the work in question, and I just hope, I hope you're with me on all this. I really do. If, if you're not, let me know and I'll stop. It's okay. I don't take it personally. Anyway, the work in question is Dvorak's Cello Concerto. Yeah. And, and, and again, this is another question. Someone said, well, you know, um, you know, how would you possibly decide which is the reference recording? Ugh, it's so easy. I can't even tell you how easy that one is. It's this sucker. Rostropovich and Karyon on Deutsche Grammophon. I mean, this thing was made in, let's see, wait a minute, 1969, coupled with Tchaikovsky's terminally boring Rococo variations. Now, Rostropovich had already recorded this multiple times. He did it before with, with Gelini or Bolt or something. This Bolt, wasn't it? Bolt or no, Gelini, I think. On, on EMI, I have that. And he did it in Russia. And then he was going to make more. He did it five or six times in his career, which is sort of unbelievable. There's, there's one in, from Prague. And, there's, there's, and this isn't even his best one. And that's where we get to the other point, which is the reference recording, the definitive one, the, the however choice. I would argue not. It never was. It never was for me anyway. It was for a lot of other people who, you know, didn't have many opportunities to listen to the work as frequently. But I will tell you this, this recording was made to be the definitive Dvorak cello concerto. You have the greatest cellist of the 20th century, arguably after Pablo Casals, and you have the major conductor, the major conductor with the major orchestra on the classical label. And, and it, this was, and it was marketed like, like they marketed the crap out of it. I remember looking at all the penguin guides too. Like when this showed up, it was like, oh, Dvorak, Rostropovich, Karyon, it's gotta be it. Gotta be it. Well, no, it doesn't have to be it. It's very good, as is always the case, almost always, I mean, with reference recordings. I don't think I've ever heard a bad one that's a reference recording. I've heard lots of people try to make bad ones reference recordings, like, you know, the Anthony Collins Sibelius cycle. Ugh. You know, that some people suggest should be some kind of reference. Don't ask me for what. But, but no, in real life, in real life, this was meant to be the reference recording, and that they were able to do. They were able to do it because it's a very good performance of the Dvorak Concerto, and they marketed the living daylights out of it. I mean, they kept it in print. They, they got very good reviews, and it deserved very good reviews, especially in 1969, let's not forget. And, and when there weren't 30 billion recordings of the Dvorak Cello Concerto roaring around, and it was, it was you know, they distributed it. People were able to buy it. Rostropovich had high visibility. Karyon had unbelievably high visibility. Uh, and they were the power couple of cello concertitude. 
So, you know, it really, it really was made for that purpose and it achieved that purpose. I, I know lots of people who knew the work from this recording and who only had this recording and they were very happy with it and they should be because it's very good. It just so happens that Rostropovich's best recording of the Dvorak concerto was his last one with Seiji Ozawa and the Boston Symphony on Erato. I mean, Erato of all labels, which then was like an independent French label that people didn't know about so much. And, and, and so no one paid attention to it. And it was competing, of course, with this, with the powerhouse of what was then Polygram, which became Universal Records, um, with all of its, you know, distribution power and force. And, you know, what do you expect? So, so it's not, it's not Rostropovich's best Dvorak cello concerto, in my view. Um, it's his fault that he made so many of them to complicate matters for, for critics in selecting the really best one. But that doesn't change the ease with which we can determine the reference recording. Um, because, and now, now we do have to talk about one other, one other recording that we do, despite like all the others that have been around. And that was the famous George Sell, Pablo Casals, Czech Philharmonic one, which I think was recorded in 1938. Now that, you know, people spoke about it as a legendary recording, but as a reference recording of the work, no, no. It was a historical recording. It had great historical importance because Casals didn't make so many cello concerto recordings when, you know, at that period in his life or whatever, I don't know. But it was historically significant. It was not always available because it was from 1938. It sounds awful, frankly. I mean, it, the sound is, is constricted, dynamically compressed, thin, clogged, it's, it's, it's awful. It really is. But it was, it's an extremely famous recording. The fact that it's a famous recording and a historical recording doesn't make it a reference recording because reference recordings require, require a certain consensus in which we can determine critically in a somewhat quasi-scientific way by looking at what people said about it and wrote about it. And a public consensus, which is far more nebulous, but which we sort of accumulate over time, like I said, over 50 years of looking at people's record collections and hearing what people have, have written and said about things and then and looking at album sales, you know, just how many copies get sold. You know, the, the, the cell Casals is the, you know, historical cult snob pick <laughs> in this piece, but it's not the reference recording. It can't be. It can't be because it just doesn't have enough musical information in the grooves to tell us what we need to know about what a reference recording ought to be. And because, like I said, it wasn't, it wasn't the, the recording that was foremost in the consciousness of most listeners over the past decades when the idea of reference recordings started to get going. The other thing I wanted to point out is actually very interesting. Let me just see, check this out here. Remember this we were talking about? This is, this is the How to Build a Record Library from by Howard Taubman from 1953, I think it was. Um, and and I, we were going through it all. And I'm wondering who they chose for the Dvorak um, back then. Let's see, chamber music, chamber music, choral music. Uh, let's see if it was even in here. <laughs> you, know, you never know. Orchestral, orchestral A and orchestral B. So let's try orchestral A first and see what we get from Dvorak. Uh, he should be in here. Yes, there's Dvorak. Oh, you only get the New World Symphony and the Slavonic dances. <laughs> I don't even care about anything else. Let's check the orchestral list B and see if there was a reference recording back in the day. Ah, there's the cello concerto. And it's Pablo Casals on RCA Victor. That's their pick because there wasn't much else. There wasn't much else in the day. In the day. But that recording soon, soon vanished as soon as stereo and other things started to come out because it was just so sonically inferior. But it, imagine, and for the past, well, for a couple of decades at least, that was the pick, and I understand. But it was routed decisively when this thing came out and people started to listen to things in stereo and sonic considerations started to matter. And uh, it's, just, it's just interesting. An interesting bit of discographic history. So this is the reference recording. It's not my favorite by any stretch of the imagination. I kind of prefer Heinrich Schiff in the Vienna Phil under Andre Previn. Boy, is that hot. Oh, it's beautiful. And there are 
wonderful, wonderful other performances. Uh, I mean, so many now that it's very difficult to come up with a reference. One of the other arguments or discussions we've been having is, is it possible today to even have a reference recording with the quantity of recordings of basic and not even not so basic repertoire? And that's a very difficult thing to say. But as I pointed out in response to that, there was a historical moment when reference recordings existed and knowing what they are is useful to people building their record collections and people who are curious about how to get started and what pieces give you a very good sense of the work and very fine performances, well recorded most of the time. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks so much for joining me. Take care.